Good to see everyone in the church, which is good. Some are on holiday, some are poorly, but most of you are here. This morning, I want to talk about Jesus. You say, I talk about it every week. Now, I want to talk about his life from the very beginning. So, it's 33 years of his life. You're looking at me with a blank face. You're not going home for a week. <laughs> well, it would be nice if it was in the days of Ezra where we sit in the, in the square whole night, whole day with our lunch packs and our water just listening to the Word of God. It would be. But we can't. I can tell you right now, I can see your faces. You can't. <laughs> I wish we all could. Probably I can't preach all day, all night either. <laughs> but they opened the scrolls whole day, whole night. Paul preached whole night till morning. Amazing, isn't it? Treasures that are stored within their hearts and lives that comes out. This is what it's all about. It's not just holding a Bible and reading from occasionally, from time to time coming to a study, these words that our life, got to be in our life constantly. So it's Isaiah 9. I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm going from the very beginning. Verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That's where we're going to start. <laughs> unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. How many of you know, between those two lines, there's one dispensation? Child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. That's 2,000 year gap in between. Talking about the millennium. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So after the millennium, we're going to reign, we're going to live, we're going to be with Christ forever and eternity. Amen. That's something worth looking for. Isn't it? Don't you want to look forward to that day? When we have no more pain, no more sorrows, no gain either. Not only no pain, but no gain. Because we're not going to be doing business or anything like that. But, or we have already gained eternal life. So we don't need to gain anymore because we have Jesus. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This, that's Jesus. And he can do all of that. He's going to do all of that as Isaiah has prophesied five and a half centuries before he was born and even after a dispensation, what's going to happen? It's amazing how God gives prophecies to the prophets and we read it, we understand it, and we look forward to it. One king, one ruler. That's what Isaiah is talking about through his prophecy. There's only one king and one ruler. But when this happens, when this is prophesied, somebody wants to wipe out that one king, one ruler. That's where it all began. <coughs> you know, our citizenship, we have dual citizenship. We all have dual citizenship, whether you want it or not. If you're a child of God, you're a citizen of heaven, 
and you're a citizen of the country where you're at. So we have dual citizenship, but thank God that we are given a citizenship that is forever. Amen. Nobody can take that away from us. And that is more, much more worth, worth it to hold on, to cling on. And even if you lose that passport, it doesn't matter. You're still citizen in the book of life. That's wonderful, isn't it, to know. But if you, if you lose your passport at the airport, you can't travel on a plane. But if you lose your passport here on earth, but yet you are a citizen and your citizenship is marked in the book of life, you will still go to heaven where your citizenship is. That's amazing. So one king, one ruler. And to, this morning we read in Isaiah all about his life since he was born right through to the time where he will perform all of this in order for us to be in heaven with him. One king, one ruler, but the world does not agree with it. So Satan tried to destroy Jesus from the very start. Why? Because he didn't want Jesus to undo what he did. In the Garden of Eden, the purpose of Jesus' coming is to undo what he did. He's been the second Adam. He brought sin into the world, so all died a second death like him. We all will die unless we have Jesus. So here Isaiah actually predicted, prophesied, and Jesus came. He did. He was born unto us. His son is given in a manger in Bethlehem. How did he try? How did Satan try to destroy Jesus? Through King Herod in Matthew chapter 2. From the very beginning, his plot and scheme was in play. King Herod making him threatened by another king. This is what Satan's ploy is. He threatened King Herod. King Herod, you're not the only king on earth or, or in, in Israel. There's another king that's just been born. Jesus was known as the king of the Jews, wasn't he? So as it was promised, he was taken into Egypt. Egypt represents the world as we know. And he was brought into the world as a man. For what? To save it. You see, Jesus, the name Jesus means Savior or to save his people from their sins. So the prophecy was so fulfilled that he had to go through all of that. He was taken to Egypt for a reason. And that reason was caused by Satan through Herod. Satan thinks he's, he's plotting and planning, but God always uses his plotting and planning to glorify him and to fulfill the plan that he has. Amazing. So the plot goes on. First, he tried to kill the child. In Matthew 2, 3, you know, the, the wise men, they came... They heard about Jesus. They were looking for a star that can direct them to where Jesus was to worship him. And all of a sudden, when they came to Jerusalem and asked about where the star was and who, where is Jesus, because they want to worship him, word got around and spread around so quick, it got to Herod. And it troubled Herod and all at Jerusalem, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, it, it troubled everybody. Because they were saying, a new king has been born. In Matthew 2.2 2, it says, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. So he secretly called these wise men, into his palace or whatever. And he told them 
What did he tell them? In verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. So, it wasn't, it wasn't a sincere, genuine asking where the child was, for he wanted to worship him, but he wanted to get rid of him. That's the bottom line. So, the wise men went. They went and they found the star. The star led them to where Jesus was. And then they found the child. They got in there. They worshipped him and gave him presents. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, when we read this passage of Scripture that they gave here, it says in, in uh, uh, verse 10, verse 11, And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with, it, with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened the treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Everything that the Bible records has a meaning. How did they know? Probably they brought gold because just in case Mary and Joseph were in need of cash, they can sell the gold. That could be one way of thinking. But the other, another way is it symbolizes divine ship, royalty, acknowledgement of royalty. He is the king, so we brought gold, which symbolizes divinity. And then frankincense. It's a white reason like gum, so is myrrh, it's taken from a tree, which is very costly and very uh, uh, nice scent, has a sweet aroma. So gold meant something. They came to worship a king, royalty. They gave frankincense, expensive, symbolizes holiness, righteousness, priesthood, speaks of the worship of God, sweet aroma, incense. It's all got meaning behind it. And then myrrh, which is the worst thing. But myrrh is also used, very expensive. In the olden days, in, in Song of Solomon, it used as a perfume. Even though, you know, myrrh is used for burial and embalming as well. Just like rabbit urine. It stinks. That's why they use it in perfume, lasts longer. So myrrh is used for a variety of purposes in them days, in the olden days, such as perfume and anesthetic, by the way. Burial, embalming, bitterness, it represents bitterness and suffering which Christ has to go through with. I read in an article, those who have arthritis, frankincense is good. That's what they said. It's good to use frankincense to rub it on whatever arthritis you've got. It heals arthritis, it says. But don't go looking for frankincense. It's very expensive. <laughs> it's a kind of a oil. It can make, turn it into oil. So they gave him these gifts, which had meaning in every gift. Then being divinely worn in a dream, God knew all of it, how, you know, Herod came to tell them secretly and go, go and find where Jesus is so that he can go and worship him. And Satan's ploy are always feasible unless you have discernment. You won't know it. But the angel of the Lord actually came to the wise men and told them, that they should not return to Herod. So they went home another way. And when Herod found out, he was furious. He was furious. And after that, in verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take this young man, and flee to Egypt. And stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. 
See, God had his hand upon his life because that was the purpose of God, the plan of God. Even Satan can't destroy it. But he tried to. So when he rose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed from Egypt. And there, 15, and was there, un and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So everything in the Old Testament is actually New Testament concealed in it. So whatever has been concealed in the Old Testament is always revealed in the New when this has happened. This was spoken in Hosea 11.1. 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod died, the Lord appeared in a dream in Joseph in Egypt and said, Rise, take this ch the child and your, his mother to Israel. And then they end up in Galilee, in Nazareth. That's where he grew up. That's where all his carpentry work is done. So the, he tried to kill the child first through Herod. And secondly, he tried to kill the man. In the wilderness. See, it goes right back to Genesis, doesn't it? How, how the evil ones try to destroy the line of, 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 of Jesus, of King, line of David, through Seth, so that through this lineage comes Jesus, through this line. So this line was trying to be, they tried to destroy this line from the very beginning. And when they couldn't stop it, when Jesus was born, he was still trying to destroy Jesus, the son. As a child, now as a man, when after Jesus, you know, came, he was sent, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized by John the Baptist, and he was sent out into the wilderness. And here the devil has his scheme again. I'm not going to read it all. Now in chapter 4, verse 5 of Matthew, it says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. How many of you know the devil knows Scripture the back of his hand? So he took Jesus up to the highest pinnacle of the temple, and then he went, throw, him, throw yourself down. He's trying to kill him, really. Kill the man. Get rid of him. But it didn't work. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And we couldn't kill him. He wanted him under his little thumb. He said, I'll give you all this if you just bow down to me. You see, Satan has a scheme from day one because he failed in the Garden of Eden. Because Adam, second Adam, came to undo what he did. And he's still plotting and planning and scheming. We must know the tricks, the ploy, the mind of the devil, how he works in order to deceive God's people. Thirdly, what did he do? Satan thought he got Jesus by killing him on the cross. Didn't he? He used Judas to betray him. <clears throat> then he used the people. Because Pilate didn't want anything to do with him. Because he found him innocent, no guilt on him. So he washed his hand and gave, handed him over to the people. When Satan thought... Pilate could condemn him, but when Pilate didn't, he put this thought in his mind to give them to the people. And what did the people say? Crucify him. Free Barabbas. But do not, whatever you do, Pilate, don't free Jesus. He's got to be crucified. See, Satan didn't know that God was using him also in order to fulfill his plan. Same as he used Job. 
uh, uh, faithfulness through Satan. But he thought he, he had it. I've got him now. He's on the cross. He was suffering with all those beating and, and spit, spitting and a crown of thorns on his head, bleeds, bleeding to death, <laughs> carrying his own cross to the, on the way to Golgotha. I've got you now. But after three days, he was disappointed. Absolutely sh shattered in his thoughts. He was beaten again. He said, no, not the third time. His plans all keep failing. So he thought of himself long and hard. Why do I always fail? Little did he know he's, he's coming against God himself. So he's deceiving himself from there. But he was thinking to himself, wow, I failed three times. And then a thought came to him, if you can't beat them, join them. I couldn't beat Jesus now. Couldn't kill him as a child, couldn't kill him as a man. And finally when I got him on the cross, he didn't die, he rose again. <coughs> so I can't beat them. Might as well join them. So he starts his mission by being an angel of light in Corinthians. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. You see how crafty he is, how he works his plans? And if Christians don't know it, they will be deceived. Here in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, it says, And now, no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his, min if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. <clears throat> See, when he was kicked out of heaven, because he wanted the most highest place in eternity, God's place. And he was kicked out. And, and since then, he wanted to have a vendetta all the way. Probably he knew when he sinned, uh, when he brought sin into the Garden of Eden and Eve and Adam fell. And he saw the punishment of God. And he thought he won then. But when God actually planned salvation through Jesus, so he blocked the line, the lineage of Jesus, and he failed again. And when Jesus was born, he tried to kill the child and then kill the man. And then when he finally got him to the cross, he thought he won, but he failed again. And now he's joining them. It's not only him, but he's got all his allies and ministers all over the world. His evil forces, his righteous, quote, righteous forces. It's all there. It's all there. Deceiving God's people by imitating, letting people think he is Christ. So when you look at the plan of Satan, now we're not talking about the plan of God, but the plan of God is also included in the plan of Satan where God allows him to do certain things for him. So without him knowing, he's serving God. <clears throat> to fulfill God's plans. You see, it's, it's right through now he was beaten on the cross. You know, though he was down, he joined. He joined God in, in actually deceiving the Christian. Right through thinking that he's the Christ, not Jesus. And this, is go this goes on until the son of petition is revealed. The trinity of Satan is always at work and they're very busy. So don't underestimate his power. Don't underestimate that he's got everyone working for him too. That's why last week I said, instead of looking at each other's faults and fighting with each other, 
and bringing division into the church with our opinions and ideas. Let us fight the common enemy who is trying to bring all this divisiveness into the church. We need to kick him out. We need to tell them there's no place for you in this church. <coughs> That's why at the end of it all, you know, he's trying, still confusing the Christians all over the world. He has, and he is. And he's still going to do it right to the end when Antichrist rises. And this error has faced the biggest deception and many has fallen for his lies. This error. You know, it, it, if you look at church history, first century, second century, third century, right down through the 21st century, he's always plotting and planning to, to destroy the church of Jesus Christ by bringing in heresies, fallacies, all kinds of of fads and phases, try to mix with Christianity and thinking that's what Christianity is about. And a lot of people, gullible people, have embraced it because they didn't know otherwise. So it is so important to learn and meditate and read and live by the Word of God. It's so important. Unless you know these things, you won't, you won't be able to tell the difference. Because he comes as an angel of light, doesn't he? And he has his ministers of righteousness all over. He has. And if we can't discern his ministers, then we get sucked into this big vacuum of falsehood anyway. We will. That's why it's so important. That's why we, we gather together, we learn together, we, we share together, we, we teach together, we preach together, and we know together what the Bible is actually saying to us. So the feud still goes on till the end of time. And it will keep going on till the end of time. When he has... No more energy or, or, or no more ploys to defeat and, and deceive Christian when, he was, when he's put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So we got to be aware of these things, church. You've got one king, one ruler. Don't let anyone come and deceive you that there's another king. No matter how hard he tries to destroy Jesus, you know what? God the Father was protecting his son all the time. Just like he protected Job. Never left Jesus or forsook him all the way in his life, apart for once when he was on the cross. He didn't want to, but... The sin on Jesus was too much, and he, God and sin don't, you know, don't, don't go together. He hates sin. That's the only time when he turned his face away. But the rest of his life, God was with him all the way. It's the same with us today. God said he will never leave us nor forsake us. And sometimes we don't believe that. 100%. When we're down in the dumps, we think God's forgotten about us. He hasn't. He hasn't. We need to know that. We need to believe that, receive that, and trust God with it. Because God will never leave us or forsake us. He will not, like he didn't on the sun. That's why, you know, we are so privileged because of God's grace. When the sin of the whole world landed on Jesus, God turned his face away. But today, because of Jesus, even though sin comes on us, we can still repent and be forgiven. Because of Jesus interceding for us 24-7. But at Jesus' time, God has to turn his face away. There's nobody in between. But we are so privileged today. 
And when God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, He means it. Means it. And you are never alone. Maybe you think you're alone. Physically, you may be alone, but you're never alone. And we need to trust God with that. We need to thank God for that. Even though we face so much of trials and hardship, we've been through all of that through scriptures and tribulation, He will always be there for us to protect us, encourage, and love. That's God's heart. God never wants to leave us. He loves us. He loves us. And you might wonder, how can God love me personally? There's so many people in the world. But you know what? He does love you personally. He knows you better than you know yourself. That's God's love for us. You know, Satan can do all he wants, but if God doesn't allow it, he can't do it. Just like Job. You can do what you like with him, but just don't take his life. So Satan can't touch his life. And today, if what God wants to promote us, he say, well, you can do what, you know, as far as, this is as far as you can go, but you can't go further. So sometimes we get, but to, to be honest, come on, we've not even tempted the way other people, don't look at Job, other people are tempted in scriptures. We've not gone through these sufferings, through testings, that much either. Have we? No, we're so well off. We're well off. Sometimes our disappointments are nothing. Our sorrows are nothing. Our hardships nothing compared to all these guys in the scriptures. If you read Hebrews, they were sown in two for their belief in God. They were fed to the lions because it wouldn't compromise. God will never bring any testing. We have it so easy today. We do. That's why we're encouraging you here for the days that are coming ahead, that's going to be really tough. Really tough. And now here, you know, when they say it's going to be minus eight, like most of we never had minus eight before. It'd be so cold. Well, how, are going to, how are we going to live? It's terrible. We start moaning and complaining. Well, we've got to be thankful it's not minus 15 yet. How about looking at it like that, from that angle? Who cares about minus eight? If you didn't have a central heating at home, if you didn't have a proper roof, you got no windows, and you're living in a shack at minus eight, what would you do? Curse God and die? Might want to. God, why am I like this? Why have you brought me to this position? We have it too easy, really. We've got houses to go back to that are warm. We've got food in the fridge. We don't even need to cook. We can be lazy. Just put a pack in the microwave and, and heat it up and eat. You know, this is our nat nature, you know, human nature. But yet we've got to start learning that we need to face hardship and we are ready for this hardship that is coming be before us. We're too spoiled. I want to take all of you, if I had money, to a place, a third world country where there's nothing and keep you there for a month. And when you come back, you'll be thanking God for the rest of your life. <laughs> we need to be strong. Jesus never compromised. When Satan came with the word of God, he told him where to go. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Man shall not live by bread alone. We've got to be ready for these days that are ahead. And we've got to know that God is never going to leave us or forsake us. Satan and his allies will be still plotting, planning, scheming, and still go on to deceive. But if we remain true and faithful in Jesus, we will always accomplish what God wants us in our lives. 
Church, it doesn't matter whether we are well off in this country. And even when we're well off in this country, we still moan. We haven't got this, we haven't got that. You know, you bring, you bring a, third, a person from a third world country and he comes and lives with you for a month. He thinks you're a flippin' millionaire. And yet we can't see that. We are so blessed. Why don't we bless somebody with our blessings? Why don't we start looking at other people and pray for them and, and you know, help them when we have everything? Church, this is how our attitudes towards life is so important how we look at it. We always got to look at God's perspective. We need to thank God for what he's done. We need to thank God for he never leave us nor forsake us. We need to thank God for his provision every day. We need to thank God for his protection every day. And we need to thank God that we are well off traveling you know, we don't need to walk three miles to get home every day. We don't need to walk 10 miles to get home every day. We, know the, we don't need to ride a horse to get home for 12 miles every day. Because then we start complaining, aching, paining, whatever. Now we have luxury. We have a little car that can sit in and press the button and drive home. And even then we complain, my car is not fast enough. Yeah, this is human nature, isn't it? Well, it's like the children of Israel. Church, we've got to get out of that place. We've got to look at God in a broader scope and broader prospect and look at how God has blessed us and how God can help us and how we are blessed and keep on moving through in this blessing to serve Him and to make Him known. Instead of looking at ourselves and looking at others who are more wealthier than ourselves, and I want that. What for? We need to understand that God blesses us and still blessing us. Whatever we have is blessed by God. You know what we need to do? Just like Jesus. When he was on the mountain with 5,000 people, all he had was what? Five loaves and two fishes. And what did he do? He didn't sit and complain. Father, well, have you brought me into this situation? How can I feed these people? with five loaves and two fish. <clears throat> what did he do? He gave thanks. Now Jesus is asking you today, what is in your hand? Whatever is in your hand, if you give thanks and give glory to God, he will multiply it. Yeah. That's the principle. That's the principle. Don't say, he's got more for I haven't got. What's in your hand? Whatever you've got in your hand, Thank God. Give Him glory. Thank Him for what you have. And you will see His blessings in your life that you can't even contain. That's what Malachi talks about. When you abide in the principles of God and His rules, do you not think I will open the windows of heaven and pour out the shower of blessing that you can't even contain? These are promises. And these promises are always yea and amen. We need to believe that. We need to trust that. We need to walk with God and not look at ourselves, but look at others and bless others more than looking at ourselves. Thank God for where you are. Thank God for what you've got. Thank God for what you haven't got. Then God will be well pleased with you and He will bless you. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So church, this year before it ends, Make sure you belong to Jesus. He is your Lord. If you are loyal, if you are faithful and true to Him, so that no matter what you go through in your life, He's going to be with you all the way. Jesus will always be there with you, never leave you or forsake you. No matter how bad our situation is, no matter how temp temptation comes, no matter what kind of testing comes in our lives, if you just hold on to Jesus, like Jesus said, he, he just challenged Satan in every step when he was tempted in the wilderness. God never left him when he was born, when Herod tried to kill. But you know what? 
And Herod wanted to make sure, even before he died, that every male child under two months got to be killed, just in case. You see, the plan of God here, Satan is frightened of all that. And it happened in Pharaoh's day and Moses' day too. The Israelites are getting too, they are growing, there are too many of them. They are multiplying too quick. Soon they're going to overtake us, they're going to come against us. To kill every male boy. That was the plan of Pharaoh. Told the nurses to kill all the male boys and keep the girls. And finally they couldn't because the nurses couldn't kill the male boys. They told Pharaoh. So they asked him to put them in the river. And that's where Moses was spared. Satan tried to kill every plan that God has. He tried to kill Moses too because he didn't want to free the Israelites from Egypt. Moses is also a type of savior, isn't he? Freed all his, God's children from the world, Egypt. Take them to the land of Canaan. This is our Christian walk. The church, God will never leave you nor forsake you. He, he, he took care of Jesus, he took care of Moses, he took care of all the prophets, he took care of every, all the apostles and disciples, and he's taking care of you today. Amen. One king, one ruler, and he still rules. And we are his citizens, and we are his ambassadors. So never ever think that God's left you, he'll always be with you. Amen.